um, this is a very special evening for for um, for 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 Bay Kai because um, we've had people that really really punched in in this organization and Richard Anderson I'm told is really at the top of that list now he's gone and there's a memorial this evening and I uh, am not here to to uh, to run that part of the meeting uh, Nancy and Susan are here to uh, to start with uh, the technology that we've had for so many years. And as you all know, we're going to be remembering Richard Anderson, who was a friend of many of us. And I hope uh, for those who didn't know him, you get a really full picture of what an interesting guy he was. Here we go. Here's our man, Richard, visible here. And Susan Wolf is going to lead us and guide us through many stories from many contributors this evening to help us remember all the wonderful and terrible things that were Richard. <laughs> so much for coming along tonight. Um, many of you may have um, actually found out that Richard passed away from a LinkedIn message that I had sent out um, shortly after I found out. Um, what we're gonna be doing tonight is we are gonna be sharing a whole bunch of stories from people um, and we have people here who have known him forever from Bay Kai, um, like I did. I met him through Bay Kai. A number of you have met him through Bay Kai. We're going to be sharing a lot of different stories this evening. Um, and so we have a number of speakers um, that have um, known him in various guises, and we'll be just gossiping, I guess. Um, I also am going to interject just a few um, quotes from people who uh, just have a number of different quotes from people that I'll just kind of be sharing. This one's the longest one, so I'll leave it up here the longest. Um, Don Norman wanted to be able to participate. Um, he's actually in Italy, as are two of our other speakers, as it turns out tonight. Um, but he did pass along this message that he wanted to, wanted to share. Um, uh, Richard was one of the often invisible hidden powers behind the scenes, making the Bay Area Kai so, uh, talk so wonderful, creative, and informative, helping to push the field forward in numerous ways. I met him early on, so long ago I can't put a date to it, the late 1980s or early 90s. He was a great moderator of panels, many of which I listened to, and in some of which I, where I was a participant. I was always impressed with his calm and calming moderation, guiding discussions even when they threatened to boil over, and reigniting them when they appeared to be dying down. He made it look easy, but for anyone who has tried to moderate a bunch of opinionated, disagreeing panelists, it can be a mentally and emotionally difficult one. Uh, and yes, <laughs> and we're gonna, and we're gonna hear, we're gonna hear about some people who have been on various panels with him. Um, when he had a debilitating illness, his friends quickly gathered together to assist him. We had all hoped that he had made a full recovery. When I moved away from the Bay Area, I didn't get to see him very much, but we still did communicate via email. I was looking forward to more fruitful interactions with him. His death is a great loss to the community, irreplaceable. So that's a message from Don Norman. Um, and what I'm gonna do now is hand it back to someone who you haven't heard from yet. I'd like to introduce Nancy to you. So this evening, I'm going to try to speak briefly about my contacts with Richard over the period 1992 to 2009, and I'll let other people take the 2009 forward part. Um, and mostly, I'm going to talk about Richard in the context of Bay, Bay Kai and community. Now, if you don't know me, my name is Nancy Frischberg. I go by Nancy F. online a lot, and I was, I'm a member of Bay Kai since 1991 which was hard because I didn't live here in 1991. I was still living in Connecticut and working at IBM in New York. But I received the newsletter and I followed all the announcements. And uh, in 93, I actually relocated to the Bay Area so I was able to participate. And the picture there is me at CHI 92 in Monterey. Thank you very much, Ben Schneiderman, for being a photographer of all of our events. So some of these images are from Ben. And the noteworthy thing about Bay Kai and Richard is 140 
programs he put together. That's not 140 speakers, because sometimes there were two distinct talks or maybe three in a single night, or there were four or five panelists on some topic. So that's a lot of people to keep coordinated by date and time. And then the other amazing thing about, I, and I got a close-up view because Richard let me guest host when he was traveling away from the Bay Area on a second Tuesday. Richard kept at least two blogs where he recorded a lot of interesting ideas. One of them was people.well.com, where he was reander, and that one has been emptied out. So all you, if you go there, you see his title or his area of specialization, user or customer experience practice, management and organizational strategy with a major focus on social innovation. But other than those headings, you know, home, work, whatever, whatever, there's nothing left in there. And I think Susan will talk a little bit more to some of that. His other blog was the Blogspot blog, and his the way he characterized that one was on experience design, practice management, and organizational strategy. And that one has content that was new as of 2019. Now, some of you may or may not know Richard and I and several other HCI people and then film buffs were part of a, a film discussion group. I know Claudia showed up there several times. You're in the audience here today. Among Richard's favorite movies was anything French and, of course, all the before movies with Julie Delpy and Ethan Hawke. So before sunrise, before sunset, and what's the third one? Before midnight? I can't remember. Anyway, he loved them all. And he, here he is. And uh, several of these people in our discussion group are, were, are now retired, but were film professors at, in San Francisco State or at uh, the College of Marin. Sorry. Yep, back again. Back. Okay. So, so if you look at the, some of the impact um, that Richard had, I actually met Richard not here in the Bay Area through Bay Kai, but actually through this local SIGS, because before I came back to the Bay Area, I actually lived in the Chicago area. And when I was in the Chicago area, we were working on um, setting up a local area SIG for Chicago, for the Chicago area, which we at that time called Chi Squared because it was Chi Chicago Chi. Um, uh, anyways, um, you know, Richard was involved with SIG Chi. So for those of you who don't know, it's ACM is kind of the parent organization. SIG Chi is a special interest group within ACM, and then Bay Chi is a local SIG. So you can kind of think of it as grandparent, parent, and grandchildren. And so we were joining the grandchildren of the many grandchildren um, of ACM and the kids of, of SIG Chi. Um, and Richard, you know, he didn't just say, oh, you know, there should be more local SIGs around. He really stepped up and he got engaged with um, ACM, SIG Chi, and he brought the people who were interested in starting up these local SIGs together. So when there was a SIG Chi conference, the leaders of these different, from these other new SIGs got together and we talked about what were some of our needs um, in terms of being able to tactically and practically run a new SIG. You know, I think it's right now, you know, today in, in the time that we're in now, we think, oh, you know, you want to have a meeting, you just, you know, throw up a meetup and, you know, you get some company to donate some space and then boom, you have a meeting and it's no problem. Back in the day, you know, over 20 years ago, you know, you had to think about, well, how are you going to get a website hosted? Where was that going to be? Is it, you know, how are you, is it going to be off of some company's name or is it actually going to have its own organization? Is it going to show that it's affiliated to ACM or not? And if it costs money to host that website, where is that money coming from? And do you have to be, a, you know, a nonprofit organization that you have to create yourself and then file a title? This is kind of overwhelming stuff, right? So Richard really helped pave the way for all these local SIGs to be able to, um, to be able to happen and to have ACM support in not having to do some of those things that you want <laughs> to avoid and ignore, like um, filing taxes. Um, but, you know, still doing the appropriate thing, like ACM files the taxes for you. Um, so you can see, you know, back when we were starting in Chi Squared, I used to think of there were mostly like around three local SIGs in the States at the time, maybe. You know, everyone knew about Bay Chi. There was one in Boston. And then there was one in, I want to say, Seattle. And there were other ones that were starting to come up, but those were like the three main ones. 
Today, there are 68 local chapters in 36 countries representing over 4,000 members. That's, that's pretty impressive. Um, as I was already mentioned as well, Richard was the program chair for many years. He was the first program chair. He helped found Big High as well, right? So um, from 1989 to 2002, he served as the, the Big High monthly program chair. And, you know, Big High offers a number of activities and services, but most people know Big High for their monthly programs. And that's basically the cornerstone of our organization. They were all speakers at Big High, right? And because Richard brought them in. And so at the time when Richard was the um, program chair, basically people thought of Richard was Baycott, right? Because he was the one who held us all together. I would actually just mention that as was mentioned with uh, the quote from Paul and as Nancy mentioned too, um, you know, when, when, uh, when Richard did step down as program chair, I was, I was actually, uh, I think I was actually Baycott chair at the time. Um, and so we had a transition um, to other program chairs. Well, we had at least two program chairs and then we had other people doing other supporting roles, all of the things that Richard had done by himself. It took many people and many volunteers to, to fill those big shoes. Um, the other thing that was mentioned, Don Norman mentioned this, Richard was a master interview. And here's actually a, a not so good picture, but um, <laughs> really? I thought I thought it was pulled from actually a, a video shot, but <laughs> it was an early days Instagram builder. Um, so this was from a conversation or an interview he had with Don Norman and, and John Kogel. And I think John will talk as well. Um, and one of the things that you notice, if you would go back and you look at the program, the list of programs, um, that Richard had that occurred during the time that Richard was program chair. Whenever he had an interview, it didn't say interview with someone else. It said a conversation with someone else. And I think that was a lot of what was behind Richard's secret sauce, right? That he treated interviews like conversations. And if we were lucky enough to be in the audience, then we got to just sit in and listen, uh, eavesdrop in on this interesting conversation. And again, you see a ton of other um, folks who, who uh, participated, um, other well-known folks in our field who have helped define our field. Uh, I did have to include this side note at the bottom. I was going through some of the older um, listings and reading through, and I just stumbled across this and it made me laugh, so I had to include it. And so if you look back on the August 13, 2002 uh, program, and you look at the description of Richard down at the bottom, he actually wrote about himself. Richard is working with Marta, who actually was our logistics volunteer at the time, to have Baykai offer margaritas in the auditorium entryway prior to each Baykai program and to have Paul McCartney publicly acknowledge that Richard was the source of the Beatles hit yesterday. He is hoping the bad sunburn on his legs heals prior to August 13, so he will be comfortable sitting down with Aaron to do this interview. So sometimes I think he just included those things to see if we read the description, but it kind of just speaks to Richard's uh, humor. All right, so I'm just going to wrap it up with uh, an end in Richard's style. So for those of you who were around when Richard was around, he used what is called an overhead projector. For those of you who may not know what an overhead projector is, there's one an example here. I think Nancy will demonstrate its use later. And he often did at the beginning of every program, he kind of did this little reveal with the paper um, to show with his handwritten note. Um, and so in Richard style, I would say, thank you, Richard, for your service to Baykai for building up our community both locally and globally, and for challenging us to keep on learning. We miss you, but we will never forget you. Thank you. So this is from Steve Portugal. I 
benefited from Richard's community building before there was a web, hardly an internet. When there were um, no options or opportunities outside what he helped us, what he, outside what he helped bring us all. It was crucial for me at an early stage of my career. Over the years, I got to know Richard in a variety of capacities as he encouraged me, edited me as a columnist, explored the ways that us consultants can provide value in a growing and challenging market. I'm grateful for his friendship, and I have so much respect for all he accomplished and the way he went about that. And I was the one who introduced Steve to Richard. So and I was the one who gave Steve his first job. <laughs> yeah. And Dave, I, I wasn't sure you were going to make it. So would you like to read your quote? <laughs> I pulled that from what you wrote. <laughs> I I I Uh, Richard was the heart and soul of Bakai for so many years, and it was a privilege and sincere pleasure to spend time with him during that period. His legacy runs deep, and his good nature, in spite of significant challenges, remains an inspiration. Thank you. You didn't know you were going to get called on, did you? <laughs> okay. And one more. Uh, besides Beikai, I was fortunate to have the opportunity to spend time consulting with him in, in the late not. He was both inspirational and personable. The UX world is richer for his work or with his loss. He will be missed. Okay, and with that, do we have Jennifer online? Okay. She is online, then Jennifer, I'm going to, we need to make sure that you can share your screen. Uh, it's okay. I don't, I don't have any um, slides. Well, then you don't have any screen to share. Perfect. No screen to share. <laughs> um, just let me know when you're ready. We're ready. Okay, so um, thank you. I don't have any slides, but I did write a little something about Richard. And um, just so you know, it's super early here. Um, I'm in Europe and um, Richard might be surprised to, to know I woke up so early to share something about him. You know, he could be a bit selfless at times, but he's also probably, you know, having a nice laugh at my bed head and pajama bottoms, you know. <laughs> um, we met at the turn of the century. Richard was curious about Viant where I was at the design, a design lead at the time. We met over coffee and discussed the firm, its culture, and how he could contribute. Before this meeting, I only knew him as the Big High Guy. I had attended meetings since about 96, you know, not everyone, but, but many. And straight away at this first meeting, Richard put me at ease. I'd soon learned this was a great gift of his, his ability to put others, even total strangers, at ease. This was attached to his empathy in my view. If I had to select one word that embodies Richard, it would be empathy. He had it in the truckloads and it was seemingly limitless. Um, Richard's empathy enabled him to understand not only the people we were designing for at any given time, but also the colleagues and teams he collaborated with and mentored in human-centered design. And by the way, while we call it human-centered design now, it wasn't so long ago it was user-centered design. Richard was among the first I heard question the term user, implying it's derogatory as akin to uh, uh, drug dealers, what drug, drug, drug dealers call their clients. Again, his empathy at play here. We continued working together after Viant SF's closure in 2001, co-authoring a paper with the awesome Jay Joichi for the DIS conference in 2002. Richard and I co-presented the paper at the British Museum in London, where the conference was being held. We were all thrilled to have the paper accepted. Then Richard and I were so excited to meet up in London and, and present it together. It felt like, you know, little kids um, unwrapping a gift for the birthday. We continued collaborating on various projects and sharing dinners at our homes with our partners and friends. Those were always joyous occasions of wonderful food. As mentioned, he was a great cook and enjoyed making food and, and great conversation and laughter. 
Richard's empathy never wavered. And so it struck me exceptionally hard to learn when his, he experienced such a rough time when his health worsened. This great man who was a conduit of so much experience and knowledge to so many didn't receive nearly enough empathy when he was most in need. My heart still really hurts for this time. During this era, I was already living abroad and helped as I was able to from afar. After some time, I was relieved to learn Richard began working again and as usual, putting his experience to use alongside his natural empathy. He focused on the, the small matter of redesigning the US healthcare system. Richard also began teaching again, another incredible gift of his. So in my view, let's not be sad about his passing. Richard lived a very full life, which is all of us and all anything all of us could wish for. He also gave everything he had to this community and we are all the wealthier for it. Uh, let's celebrate Richard's life, honor the legacy of his teachings and cherish that part of him that lives on in us. And of course, share it with others, which ultimately is what Richard would want. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for um, getting up early or staying up late, depending upon your perspective. We have a few more people who are in very early time. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, thank you. Um, uh, Richard uh, uh, was a, a, a colleague and a very good friend of mine uh, since about uh, 2000. He's been a monumental influence to both me and the design world. I just want to share uh, three short things uh, and keeping it short because it is five in the morning where I am at. Uh, in Amsterdam. Um, I want to just talk about my meeting with him at Sikai, uh, my reconnection with him in 2009, and uh, just a quick word about his design legacy, which sounds like a, a contradiction because it's a huge uh, uh, legacy. Um, I first met Richard in 2001 when I was appointed as the design community liaison to the ACM Sikai Executive Committee. The committee at that time was quite cold to the design community, except of course for Wendy McKay and Marilyn Tremaine who appointed me. Nevertheless, at these SIGCHI executive meetings, Richard was a source of support and sustenance, helping me to bring in the design community into CHI. This was eventually a successful, if temporary success. The pinnacle of that success is when I teamed up with Terry Swack and Alan Chalmers to form the conference series we knew as the Ducks Conference, designing for the user experience. For the initial 2003 conference, I tapped the most natural selection of program chair, as did Terry, and we had the classic pairing of Richard Anderson and John Sapolsky. That created one of the most fulfilling combinations of design and HCI I had ever seen. And indeed, that continued on for uh, two more uh, Ducks conferences as well. But moving on to the middle of 2009, when he reappeared to us, the extent and story of his illness, I'll leave others to discuss. I only want to mention that many people reached out and helped Richard, and many people were also rejective of his seeming lack of gratitude or some lack of graciousness. And I only want to mention to these people, to these kind people and his friends, that Richard was always quite ill and struggled with his illness even when he thought, even when we thought he was back to normal. I want to relate just one story. Uh, he often, um, I, for many years, I acted as a post box for Richard's mail, and he would come to pick up his mail. Uh, he often came uh, to pick up his mail while I was at work, and he met with my late husband, Morris Taylor, and they enjoyed exploring the city together. They had many museums, and they ate many lunches together this time when he was, when he was homeless. Especially early on when Richard was clearly not himself, Morris gave him a lot of uh, very important uh, uh, emotional uh, uh, and as well as uh, uh, material support. One night, um, Richard came over for dinner with my husband and a couple of friends, and I was a little scared how it would go because of Richard's uh, mental state at the time. The dinner actually went great, and Richard uh, was just his old self. And I also said to Morris, wow, Richard is back from the, to the, for, as like he was in the old days. And Morris corrected me. He said, no, you don't understand the tremendous effort it took him to give us a good time this evening. And that was indeed the, going to be kind of the 
the route he would be following for the rest of his life, making a tremendous effort to give us a great uh, experience. Um, in in the, um, I just wanted to say that, in, uh, kind of in, just in closing, in his last days, he sent me what I believe were among some of his last text messages. And, and still, even then, among the desperation, there were still cogent and powerful pleas for the design of medicine to be better suited for giving the medical profession the tools they needed to really care for a patient. Um, it was a still a testament to his passion for, for great design. I continue to read and study his blogs, and I'm going to make sure his design legacy continues with a new book I'm writing on design and UX. Hopefully it will be a fresh look on how design can innovate products and services, which will draw heavily on the lessons learned from my friend Richard Anderson. Richard, may your legacy uh, continue to bloom long after you have passed away. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, seeing as I'm doing so well with the technology, I think what we'll do is we'll come back to the quotes later. Um, I think what I'd like to do now is I'd like to, um, and I know, John, I said you were next, but I'm going to let, we're doing kind of in, in time zone order, so I'm going to let Marilyn go next, if you don't mind, and you're after. Okay. So over to you, Marilyn. Okay, I don't have any slides or any screen share because I got contacted today and I had a lot of other things on my plate. But I'm, I've known Richard Anderson since the beginning, um, partly because I was a key person in SIGCHI from its beginning. And to my, my feeling is the top local chapter in and Sinkai was the was Baikai. And that's in part because Richard Anderson was so key in doing a lot of work with it back in the very early, earlier days. I I, I sort of left Sinkai in about 2001 when one of the uh, universities that employed me insisted that I can't have any other things besides uh, I work at the university, and that was because they wanted me to be department chair. Uh, so I apologize for stepping down from being chair of Sinkai a long time ago, but I was pushed pretty hard. In any case, uh, my, my memories of, of Richard is uh, every time uh, we had many, many exchanges of email and many conversations, and I was very happy to for him to be on the Sinkai board. I've always been in the early stages when Sinkai, when Sinkai was formed. I was always a member of the board in some position. And, and he was there and it made all the meetings just that much more interesting and exciting. And I just remember every every week, every day almost, a, a, a question about this, a question about that. And he was such an interesting and funny and exciting person to be around and so smart and so quick. And I, I left California many, many years ago before even Sinkai was formed, but it was always uh, great to go back. It was always great to go to a Baikai meeting and it was always great to meet up with Richard Anderson. What a wonderful, kind and interesting person. You don't run into those people every day. And you don't run any into the kinds of people who are all those things. And you esteem them, but a lot of people just ignore them. And he was there not doing it because he wanted to be anybody great or anybody special. He was doing them because he was excited about the field. He was excited about helping people, exciting about changing things. And that was so nice and so decent. And yes, at some point, I worked to make sure that he got an award from Sinkai because he so deserved it. And sometimes a lot of people like him are ignored because you get all the people who want to be famous and push themselves. But he wasn't that kind of person. He was just one of these incredibly smart, very interesting, very creative souls. And I'm so happy that I, I've known, known him in my life. Um, 
I think I'll leave it at this because I haven't written any slides. <laughs> <laughs> no slides were needed. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, so I should, I didn't um, introduce yes, Marilyn um, Tremaine, uh, Manti. You, you, we heard from about Marilyn from Stacy, and before that, that was Jonathan Arnowitz. For any of you who didn't know his last name, because my slides weren't working. Okay, now we're going to introduce John Colco. Okay, most people know who John Colco is, a man who needs no introduction. So I'm not introducing you. I appreciate that. Please let me know if you could see my slides. Okay, and. Uh... Okay. Perfect. Thanks, thanks, Susan and Nancy, for putting this together. I just have a few couple thoughts I'd like to share, and um, thanks for giving me some some time this evening. Um, I worked with Richard on Interactions Magazine from about 2007 to about 2010, um, and I remember very much actually when I applied to be editor in chief of the magazine, I got a message back from Gary Olson that said essentially like, "Yeah, we'd like you to be editor in chief, but you know, I'm paraphrasing poorly." Um, we're afraid you're going to fuck it up. And so we're going to bring in this adult, <laughs> Richard, uh, to sort of chaperone you. Um, and so he did. <laughs> um, and so I got to work with uh, Richard over the next three or so years. And what you're seeing here is actually a, a very crappy resolution photo from the first day we met in ACM headquarters. Um, this is the two of us brainstorming. Um, you know what it is we were going to go do and um you know it, it's a little difficult to see again the quality is pretty bad but if you kind of poke at these these are names of folks that um we were we were hoping would um, give us some of their time uh volunteer with the with the magazine i'm sure you might re you know, recognize yourself or others here um and the majority of these came from richard because again i was like 12 years old or something like that when i when i was asked or, or when i uh when i asked to do this um um, and I just appreciate just the wealth of networking ability he had. I mean, he knew everybody um, and he didn't just know them. He was sort of honed in. Like, had he been a bad person, he would be the kind of person who would just pick at something terrible. But he's a great person. Um, and he was able to share great stories about each of these people. And um, just the story about this particular photo at the end of the day, um, toward the end of the day, somebody kind of poked their head in the conference room and said, I don't. I don't think you're supposed to have those post-its on the glass. <laughs> um, and that was sort of the demeanor of the ACM office at that point. Um, so I think this was like an, a, a, um, a, a preview of what was to come, I suppose, in terms of the way that we approach things. Um, but uh, in August of 2007, Richard and I published um, the vision and structure we had for the magazine. And this is, this is not, you know, revolutionary. We built on a lot of the great um, uh, predecessors we had, but really we were trying to, support John, Ryan, Frank, Bill Hefley, and Brad Meyer's vision. And so what I'll, I'll just read this very briefly um, because it's probably too small to read on your story, uh, your screen. We see a world rich with culture, emotion, and human connection. The human built world has afforded a sense of beauty, sublimity, and resonance. And through our advancements to technology come advances in society. At the center of these advances are interactions, conversations, connections, collaborations, and relationships within and across multiple disciplines with and without technology. Um, you know, the, the language aside, um, the ideas there, uh, I think, are around people and not around really technology at all. And that was something that Richard cared a great deal about. Um, and from here, um, we started publishing. And uh, I think we were sort of both astounded at the level of access that being editors in chief of a magazine like Interactions gave us. Um, this was one of Richard's um, favorite sort of successes early on uh, in our experience here about, you know, maybe a year into it. Um, we got Richard Seymour to um to contribute to the magazine and we did it because richard just asked him <laughs> and like richard didn't know richard but he just i think called him up or sent him an email and said hey would you do this um you also notice that like the the article has this like or f off and do something less dangerous and that was actually another sort of point of contention which is that uh richard and i did not play very well with with ACM at this point, uh, we were still sort of learning what we could and couldn't do. And everybody thought I was going to be the problem child. But in fact, Richard was pushing an awful lot of this, um, you know, like, how far can we take things? Um, this is us getting our hands slapped for, for using an expletive. And um, Richard Seymour was generous enough to allow us to edit his words to have an asterisk. Um, and, uh, and sort of like keep rolling with that. Um, in September and October of 2008, um, the Bardzells submitted a fantastic article, um, which was about uh, the nature of virtual worlds. Back then, it wasn't exactly new, but Second Life was starting to be sort of a thing. 
Um, and, and the article was about sex and virtual worlds. And these were the images that, um, that Jeff Bardzell had sent us. And these were actually some of the tamer ones. Um, and this was the note we got from, um, again, from the ACM saying, uh, you can't, you can't publish this. Um, and I remember Richard, <laughs> Richard going to, Richard going to town on it. Um, it was not actually me who was so adamant about, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, free speech, I suppose, because Richard felt very passionately that, no matter what the research work was, because it had such a human impact, it was worth publishing. And he's right, um, because the piece was the piece was excellent. And this was a consistent theme of, you know, <laughs> that we would probably do something we weren't supposed to. We'd get yelled at and, and it would be you no know, both of us. But for the most part, Richard, who would get very, very animated about doing what is right, what is right for the authors and what is right for the, the sort of implicit nature of the work itself. Um, this is the body of work that we that we published. We published 18 issues. Um, we were very, very proud of them. And, you know, Richard articulated to me both while we were doing it. But then after some time had passed and I caught up with him again, um, how much it meant to him to to create these works, because I think just like um, with some folks mentioned when he when he ran a conference or when he brought together, you know, a group of people in a in a conversation, he wasn't very much. He was in, in very many ways a curator or an editor as a as a person. Um, he curated good ideas into a package and each one of these covers which represents some articles represents a curation of ideas um i'll just sort of end with with what i think was um was one of the biggest ideas because i caught up with him um toward the end of his life and and we were reminiscing a little bit about interactions um and this is one of our this was one of our covers that turns out he was very very pleased with it was toward the end of our experiences as editors this is in june of 2010 um, and the cover story is by Hugh, uh, who's on the on the call here, along with uh, Rajiv, Shelley, and Paul. And um, the the article is a phenomenal article, nicely done, Hugh. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, and and it spoke to Richard because it reframes and recasts um, the the sort of health industry um, as being less about um, what we might know it as. I go to a doctor, I'm given pills, etc., and more about wellness, about self management, about um, being able to sustain, being able to be a whole person and being seen in context. Um, and this particular chart that, that is an excerpt from the article, I actually think if you look at emerging there really summarizes the way that Richard, I think, wanted desperately for the healthcare industry to be, uh, as he was experiencing, you know, the, the, the column on the left, um, very, very cognizant that the world could be a certain, a certain different way. Um, this was this was one of his favorite issues. This was one of his favorite pieces. Um, so I'll sort of leave you all with with this. And this is how I remember Richard, um, which is um, this is actually a picture from, I think, Kai Florence. I had a hard time putting together the years here. But, um, you know, my my sort of memory of Richard as a human experiencing life was eating food and drinking, in, in this case, probably shitty grappa, <laughs> some kind of disgusting wine, uh, and just talking and talking about, you know, the nature of all the different things that we're discussing tonight. So, Richard, thank you for uh, the impact you've had on, on my life. I miss you, and I, you know, I, I hope I'll see you again sometime. Thank you, John. Thank you. <laughs> um, terrific. All right. Um, I don't need my slides now because the rest of the people are in the room. So up next, we have Peter Merkels. And I'm going to ask you to stand here so that the audience can see you. Oh, dear. Are you going to read the whole thing? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Um, my Richard story is a little different than the ones we've been hearing uh, in that uh, I didn't meet, I'm going to take out my iPhone because I have some notes. Um, uh, I didn't meet uh, Richard uh, through Bay Kai. Uh, I, when I was 25, 1997, I was working at Studio Archetype as a web developer. And I had read my Don Norman and I had read my Richard Saul Warman. And somehow I, I had been I had been made aware that there was a class you could take in this stuff. And uh, in 1997, uh, in, from October to December, I took uh, Richard's uh, user-centered design and usability engineering 
night class uh, at the College of Notre Dame. It was through UC Extension, but at the College of Notre Dame, I'd get on Caltrain and come down. I didn't have a car. Maybe I drove with friends. I don't know. Um, to learn what this thing was, you know, and it's the literally the only formal instruction I've ever had in this work that we do. Um, and, uh, but to it, I credit, uh, I, I started that class a web developer and I came out as Studio Archetype's first ever interaction designer. Um, I changed my title and that was what set me on the path that I've been on ever since. And um, I'm generally an autodidact, but Richard was uh, one of the few people who I would call a mentor. Um, I just wanted to say a couple other things. Um, one thing I'll, and this has come out a lot, I think one thing I'll uh, remember him for is his selflessness. Uh, programming Bakai, editing interactions, as we've just been hearing, the teaching he did with me, other ways he gave back. Uh, he always did work to advance this community, and that's something that I aspire to. And then a last thought, which is the last time I saw Richard, which wasn't a special thing necessarily. I didn't realize it would be the last time I'd see him. It was probably in 2017. It was definitely in Oakland, California, where I live and where I was working. And it was at a creative morning event, and which is mostly a bunch of millennials hanging out for breakfast, hearing some artists talk about, you know, um, letterpress or whatever kind of hipster thing they were into at the time. And I don't remember who was um, speaking, but I saw Richard there. He was probably wearing his beret or some weird headwear um, in that Richard style. But it struck me that he drove from wherever the hell he was living at the time, somewhere out on the ocean, came all the way to Oakland early in the morning to sit in this room with 30 other folks that he didn't know to learn something new, to just stay connected, stay involved, stay engaged. And that's something else that I also aspire to, <laughs> uh, uh, to, never, to never stop learning, to never keep trying. Uh, he was always, always open and, and interested and uh, for that, I, that, that's how I will remember him, and I uh, miss him. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, I'll show a picture of him actually speaking at a Creative Mornings. <laughs> um, you're next. You are. So. so I have these cards now, like I prepare them in case winning the Oscar or something, but it's not going to happen. Yeah, this is Alp, and uh, my last name is too long, so I don't use it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but it's great to see uh, some friends here. Uh, Jennifer, hi, way up there in Europe. Um, Jonathan as well. Um, so before I start, we actually work together at Yahoo. I don't know if anybody mentioned it, but Richard was there as well at some point. So there was a fun experience um, beyond just uh, Beikai. But um, today we're celebrating Richard's life and uh, what could be a better place than here, Beikai, with all the contribution he has done, he had done over the years. Um, I think if there's one thing that we can all agree on, um, Richard uh, was anything but ordinary uh, in many ways. Uh, he was the kind of guy who could uh, make an academic um, lecture sound like a discovery uh, show or uh, make an observation feel like an epic adventure. Um, just like some of you, Stacy, my first uh, meeting with Richard was over a phone when I was trying to set up KCKI, Kansas City chapter of the Sikai group. Um, so he just called me uh, and said, I'd like to have an interview with you. You know, what do you guys do there in Midwest? Like, do you, do you guys have any designers or what's going on? Because he was going to write an article. Uh, and there was, uh, for, at the time, he was the, um, uh, he was in charge of the local chapters. And, uh, and I think he was puzzled by Kansas City chapter, but uh, nonetheless, it was great. 
And uh, that was really surprising to me in many ways because he opened the gateway immediately and gave incredible support. So one of the things, uh, most people don't realize this, but coming from Midwest, um, Bay Kai and, and overall uh, the user interface community in the Bay Area had this glass wall. You couldn't easily get in and penetrate and become part of it. And uh, so Richard actually opened the gate for that. And I'm so grateful uh, for that. Um, so he, he was a, a true thinker uh, in many ways, uh, the kind uh, who, could, uh, who could face multifaceted problems and look at it from different perspectives. And, uh, and at the same time, um, you know, he could sit down and discuss the meaning of life uh, over a cup of coffee. So, um, uh, you know, we had great uh, conversations uh, many, many times. And uh, he had a way of making even the most mundane topics seem fascinating, um, keeping you up in the air, like, is it this or that, and then puzzle you. Um, I remember the time he turned a discussion on quantum physics uh, into an organizational design and, uh, and the similarities between the two, particularly on um, superposition quantum physics and multidisciplinary teams and how they actually have common ground. Um, so uh, the other thing is, is that, uh, as some of you mentioned, uh, let's not uh, forget his keen observational skills, uh, not just uh, topics, but people as well. And, uh, and some of you mentioned that he would just tune in and extract somebody's views without any bias. Himself was opinionated, but he would not bring it in. And I always admired it. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, I think beyond his brilliance, Richard was uh, a facilitator of ideas, debates, and friendship. Uh, and he, he was absolutely uh, stunning at that. Um, he had this uncanny ability to bring people together, whether it was just a Beikai event or um, uh, a cooking uh, night, um, social clubs, or just a casual gathering at his place many times. He made, uh, he made sure that we all felt welcome and there was uh, never a dull moment uh, when he was around. In his own quiet and private way, Richard left a mark on all of us, I think. He reminded us that life should be a blend of serious thoughts, laughter, deep observations, and random jokes. He encouraged us to think, to question, and cherish every moment, especially in his late years. So here's to Richard, our private thinker, our facilitator of fun, and our keenest observer. If he was watching uh, at the moment, right now, he would probably say, okay, Alp, let's hear the other perspectives. Fears. Cheers, Richard, we'll miss you. You won the you won the Oscar. Yes. The, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Al. And I'm gonna now hand it over to Jaime. This is Jaime Guerrero. Thanks, Susan. <clears throat> no slides. Uh, <clears throat> so I met Richard in 1994, like two other people here. I attended Usability Engineering Workshop, UC Berkeley Extension at Menlo College. And I was looking at the four inch binder of all the handouts that I didn't think to bring, but I was looking at it this morning, trying to find, there was only one article in that entire uh, binder that was written by Richard Anderson, which tells you a lot of what you need to know about Richard that I guess all of us already know. Um, 
So uh, I, I came up with a couple of words. I'm just going to read off words and then talk about them. So every, we've been we've mentioned uh, other people have mentioned the word empathic, which is sort of a very key uh, part of uh, Richard's personality. I associate that also with activists, uh, uh, particularly in phase two of his life, which is post catastrophe. His, uh, the, so, oh, oh, I forgot to mention. I uh, really so of course uh, Richard was just my instructor for three of those classes. But I didn't really know him as a person, you know, instructor. Uh, but in 2011, when the word got out among the Beikai mailing list about um, the catastrophe and his blog, My Real Life Unnecessary Nightmare, which of course I read, um, I arranged to meet up with him in Sausalito. We had dinner and uh, that began our actual friendship. Um, and at the time, of course, as you all know, he was homeless and living in his car. and. Uh, that began a period of five or six years where um, he would stay in my house and cat sit for me. That was sort of the exchange. Uh, but of course, he really liked not living in his car for a week or two when I was traveling. Um, so that's when I really got to know Richard. Um, but uh, to continue the thought about em empathy and activism, uh, here's the thought. Uh, all of his work with Beikai was Richard being Richard, which is about the user, those the other people, you know, he's a, it's really not, there's no ego there. It's all about him doing good to the others. But it changed when he, not so much during his crisis period, but uh, say maybe 2013 or something, when his medical condition got a little better, his life stabilized, and he started working again. Now he became an activist. So suddenly the difference is empathy is you're feeling somebody else's pain. Suddenly he's feeling his own pain. I mean, what he did with that was different. Um, I mean, it was the same, right, actually. Uh, but there was a, a, a an interesting change of intensity when it's not just feeling somebody else's pain. Anyway, let me read off a couple other words. Earnest. Uh, faith. This is a man with beliefs that he, he's pretty stubborn about. I mean, he sticks with them. So that that's sort of an interesting dimension. Uh, part of the faith, another word that comes to mind is romantic and, and has a, a vision of life as it could or should be, the literal, literary definition of the word romantic. Um, obviously kind as opposed to nice. He was really much more about being kind. Uh, uh, so Socratic teacher is what I immediately picked up from him at the very beginning of our relationship as a teacher uh, in that he never had the answers. He said, here, read this other guy's paper, usually in the case of classes, or in the case of as a Bay Kai host or a Kai host, he was never speaking. He was always getting the other guy to speak. Uh, so uh, an interesting person in that he really was deflecting the spotlight to somebody other than himself. I guess there's humility there. Um, um, he would have made a terrific talk show host. Uh, and then uh, 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 just... Uh, personality or physical characteristics, the black blazer. This is something I think he started in the second phase of his life. I don't remember him doing this in Beikai, but from 2011 on, he was never seen without a black blazer. Never. Dinner, lunch, of course, making presentations. Uh, you know, he's very active in MedX, which I guess you'll talk about, Susan. Yeah, anyway. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> the black blazer and, and the overhead. Okay, thank you so much. All right. Um, I guess the last speaker is me. Um, and I do have some slides, so I have to do this. Um, just talk amongst yourselves for a moment. Um, uh, where, let's see. You know, I'd be happy to just say one thing while you're looking. Please do. Um, <clears throat> uh, people mentioned how when Richard let go, there were so many different plates to spin. So I was one of the program chair coordinators, along with at that um, in the first cycle, Rashmi Sinha, 
And then she got busy and ended up selling her company to LinkedIn and it was SlideShare. Anyway, I'm I'm sorry to just say that I, I I stepped into a role that Richard had really surfed so beautifully at a time when interaction design was just absolutely as sexy as it ever could have been. I'm sure there'll be another era like that, but it, he wrote that with such verve and um I'm really glad to see everybody come together and remember him. It was a wild and crazy, uh, blazing meteor behind which I was always delighted to see him. Thank you very much, Paul. That's, so that was Paul Sass. I actually, I don't know if you were on earlier when I read a quote from you. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. Okay, fabulous. Okay. You can keep stallings while I do this. Well, I have to say, like, I didn't know <laughs> keep going. how many cool people, like the very first Bake Hive was on the Xerox star. And you just see every single person that is important to our field. Don Norman, obviously, Jacob Nielsen, but like Jaron Lanier, I think of as one of the deepest people, but also Doug Engelbart, like Alan Kay. Like Alan Kay is the guy who his thesis in 1968 was the iPad. Alan Kay, who every time I lose a phone, I quote, because he said, look, you won't have ubiquitous computers until you can afford to lose them like pencils. And Richard knew all those people. He drew all of them together. It was really cool to watch. I was amazed to hear that Peter Merholtz was like trained or like, you know, mm -hmm. midwifed into the field. Crazy guy. I did know at the end, his life mainly revolved around things that were going on in his head. And it didn't seem like a happy head. But uh, really, I'm so glad everybody got a chance to come together and honor Richard. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, so I'm Susan Wolf. Um, and I guess... I've had the pleasure of knowing Richard for an extremely long time. Um, uh, known him professionally, known him personally. Um, our our lives have kind of been um, sort of intertwined for um, since the start of Bakai. So I was um, one of the original founders of Bakai, um, along with other people who were in the audience. Um, and it was a great opportunity for um, us to do something in the Bay Area that was a bit special. Um, and we, um, many of you might remember, like this picture of Richard's like everywhere. Um, it was kind of uh, what, we, what we remember him looking like, <laughs> um, kind of just peering at us, right? Um, I brought a prop. I, I brought a prop. This is, um, it's in the uh, back of, front of the room, back of the room, by the, by the cookies, the important place by the cookies. Um, and this was something that um, Bakai gave him when um, he uh, eventually stepped down. Uh, at, so there were some familiar signatures on here, a lot of unfamiliar, a lot of people who are not here tonight. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to share, one of the original um, people who was involved with us at the start of the, I have to, I can't hold three things. Yeah. I can't hold three things. Um, but. One of the, um, I, I learned some trivia. Um, some of you, I know Dave, you'll remember, oh, oh several of you will remember um, Ellen Francic. And Ellen reminded me, she reminded me how he got the name Reander. Does anybody, anybody know that? Oh, I feel like I'm teaching. I do this. Now, who remembers? <laughs> no. um, he got the name Reander from when he, well, from when the, he worked at Pac Bell because that was the way email addresses were formed. It was the first name, the first initial of the first name and the middle initial, and then the first four characters of your last name. So that's where Reander came from. And Jaime, you showed up, sent me a funny picture of, about how he noticed it everywhere then. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's just a little bit of uh, trivia because that was all part of the, the start of Bakai. And he, he definitely um, you know, became known as Reander to all of us. 
Um, and I guess as everybody has shared, um, you know, he was a huge influence on a lot of a lot of us um, at that time. Um, the good news about going last is a lot of my thunder has already been stolen, so I can go quickly. Um, but one of the things that um, Stacy and um, Marilyn and a number of people mentioned, um, Alp, you mentioned about the connecting um, with the with the world and connecting with various um, organizations around uh, Kai organizations and various um, you know UX whatever we were calling it back then um, over the years. And one of the things that he did was he connected with folks in India, and he found all kinds of opportunities for me. For instance, I got I got to um, give the first ever keynote address at a Kai conference, and in, I mean it wasn't called Kai, but it was called Easy Two Thousand and One. Um, so that was the year. Um, but you know, I so I had the opportunity to um, go meet with the Kai community in India, which was great. He ended up going a couple of years later, um, and so it was just it just making those kinds of connections and those kinds of opportunities for people. Um, Jaime uh, made reference to uh, sort of later in life. So, I mean, I've, we've gone through a lot of, you know, sort of his, his career and all of the wonderful things that he did um, in our field. Um, but as uh, several of us have mentioned, he did um, get to a point where he um, came, hit, some rough times and um, nobody really knew what was wrong with him um, or he had theories, but we had other theories. Um, meanwhile, he had a very, very, very interesting um, time of it. Um, he did chronicle it all in a blog that Jaime mentioned. Um, interestingly, he took the blog down a, a few years ago because he thought people would think he was crazy. Um, and so, it, and he thought it was lost and he got rid of every bit of words that he wrote um, off of his computer. But Nancy said, hey, what about that Wayback Machine? And guess what? I found it on the Wayback Machine. Um, so if you are interested, it is, um, as he would say, you know, it's quite, it's quite a disturbing read if you're not familiar with it. But if you wanna get a sense of what was going on and sort of making some of these connections that you've been hearing about all of the, all of the really wonderful things that we um, knew and love about his earlier um, sort of career. And then um, sort of what he was going through a bit later in life. Um, this makes for some pretty scary bedtime reading, um, but uh, suggest you take a look at it. Um, as was mentioned, um, a number of us did ultimately um, sort of come to his rescue. So he wrote about the arrival of the cavalry. Um, uh, we all got together at Hugh Dubberley's office in the city um, and started doing a number of things to try to help him. This was after um, Claudia had spent time helping him for a long time prior to this. Um, so we've all, we've all had our share of um, supporting Richard over the years. Um, mentioned a bit about his car. Um, and several of us are familiar with this car. Um, I don't know, um, he and I affectionately called it the Chateau, um, given that he lived there for in it for quite some time. Um, this was what he would refer to as his bedroom. Um, so down by the Presidio, he would park his car at night by the Presidio. Um, Evidently, I took this picture when there were no cars there, but evidently at night it was bumper to bumper with um, homeless people and he, um, that they were, they were all lined up. That was a great spot for that. So that was his bedroom. This was his living room um, down by Chrissy Field. Um, and he spent quite a bit of time there, but he managed somehow to um, be industrious. He even made the cover of the Marin Independent. Right. Um, just so happened he was interviewed when they were counting the homeless. There was a place that he took advantage of in um, in San Rafael called the Ritter Center. And he would go there to do his laundry and shower a few days, a few times a week. Um, but he was, through all of this, he was actually very, very uh, good at improvising. And we joked about um, Starbucks 
and the Mill Valley Library being his two offices um, where he would spend lots and lots of time. And the Mill Valley, Mill Valley in general and the Mill Valley Library in particular were um, very, very special to him, not just even during that phase of his life, but because of that phase of his life. Then going back afterwards and taking advantage of um, lots of the wonderful events that they offered there. And he got very, very friendly with the head librarian there and um, was very welcoming to him, even during his, when his somewhat disheveled days, but then when he, you know, cleaned himself up. Um, this picture, you've, this, this lousy picture, <laughs> you've now seen um, a few times. Um, and the reason I took this picture, and I know John had to go and Dawn isn't here um, tonight, but um, Richard was very, very um, um, touched by this particular event. This happened in late 2011. Um, I saw Kathleen Watson on the call. Um, Kathleen made it available, uh, made the Academy of Art University available for this wonderful event. And Richard was homeless when he was doing this. He, he had a two hour interview on stage. There were about 200 people in the audience um, where he interviewed Don and um, John on and the topic, the, the, the title of that talk was um, Out With The Old, In With The New. And at that point in time, he was talking about how things had to change. And um, I'll come back to that in a minute. But I did wanna say that this was, this was really, really a special time for him because it, it like gave him himself back. For those, those two hours, he had himself back. And it was just quite a wonderful thing to see. Um, John already talked about this. I figured he would, but I thought I'd put this picture in and I was going to say exactly the same thing. One of his, um, you know, favorite articles and point, probably most poignant, um, you know, publications and articles was this particular one um, from Hugh Deberly and co. Um, and as John and others and uh, others have mentioned and um, uh, Jonathan had mentioned, he did become very active in in thinking about healthcare and thinking about um, the healthcare system and how to fix a broken system. And he got very involved with various things like this was, um, you know, an event health 2.0. Oh, um, he spoke about it. So that crazy creative mornings thing that happens all over the world, not just in Oakland. Um, he spoke, he actually was on this, um, he spoke at um, San Francisco creative mornings about the need for um, transformation of the patient experience. Um, so it's quite a, quite a nice summary of some of the things that he was thinking about early in his sort of um, journey. He also got very involved in um, sort of patient empowerment. And he came across um, this walking gallery. And it was the idea of really sharing your health stories. and. This woman, Regina um, Holliday, was, uh, is an artist. And what she would do is she would paint people's stories on jackets. People would bring them jackets. And so, you know, those black blazers that we were talking about? Well, he brought one of those black, uh, that's hard to say, black blazers to Regina. And she painted his story on the back of this jacket. Um, I actually have the jacket in, in my closet. Um, and it was the story, you, it's hard, a bit hard to see, but you know, here's, here's his car, home sweet home, it says on there, um, among other things. Also, I'll talk about this in a minute, but he was really, um, you know, a strong proponent of social media and Facebook. And he was saying, you know, you're stupid because you never look at Facebook. You don't care about Twitter and all of these things. And he saw it as a way to learn. And he taught me that you know, there's a lot of valuable things that you can learn. I mean, there's a lot of garbage as well, but there's a lot of valuable things that you could learn. Um, so he got so active involved in this. Um, this, is just an, this wasn't Regina. This was another of the patients that were um, just showing off his jacket. Um, and someone mentioned, uh, I mean, I think you mentioned um, Medicine X. Um, and he got very involved in that. Um, Suzanne had gone to some events with him at Medicine X as well. Um, so again, this is all about 
trying to really, um, you know, make sub substantive changes in our healthcare system. This is a, his portrait that was taken and when he was um, a e-patient scholar as part of the, the program, he would apply um, to be, uh, uh, you know, to participate in this and to get a scholarship to participate in the program. Um, and he started running lots of lots of events, whether it's about um, you know healthcare or you know um, other kinds of things. Um, we've already mentioned a number of you have experienced him as a student teaching through UC Extension. He also taught um, with John at the Austin Center for Design, um, and he taught at General Assembly um, with me. As well, um, speaking of black blazers and black outfits, um, this was the last day of one of his classes in Austin, and they all decided they were going to dress like Richard. <laughs> and they surprised him and all came like this. Yeah. Um, I, I said that he and I, have sort of our lives kind of became intertwined a lot. What I didn't mention is that he had the habit of like, working with me and like living in my house and stuff. So he moved into my house when, um, when I, I moved to Australia in 1995, he moved into my house there uh, in Berkeley when I moved, when I moved to Australia. And then um, he did live in my house. So he wasn't actually homeless for the past, um, once he got out of his car and starting at the end of, um, I mean, he was homeless and that he didn't have a home of his own but he was living in my house and um, over on the coast side since um, the end of 2011 when I bought my house. Um, so when he wasn't in Austin or he wasn't um, house sitting for Jaime, um, that's where he was. So fortunately the chateau had a nice place to sit and I didn't have to go live in, down by the Presidio. Um, but one of the things that we did do was um, we decided that was at a point when I was, um, I had sold um, my business and I was teaching at General Assembly and um, we decided we were going, we thought it would be good to start a little sort of social impact kind of consultancy. So when you see things about OE strategy, that's what that is. Um, so it's kind of the, the consultancy that I, I trade on or when I doing consulting, but um, one of the things that we did was we started doing a number of different workshops and a number of different events. And um, so if I like the word activism. Um, that was something. Um, so we ran workshops and he was being, questioning, the, you know, are, are designers becoming the new activists, for instance? Um, um, and so um, having lots of interesting discussions about that. And we developed and both ran together and independently. We've run workshops on this, um, this idea of questioning everything and the idea of how we can go about designing for um, effectively for social impact. Um, and so starting to do things like, like that, which kind of, you know, kept um, him kind of trying to work. Um, but as multi, many people said, through all of that, you know, it wasn't just about work and it wasn't just about health. Um, health, he enjoyed life. He, we've already heard a lot about film and he loved film. He loved all kinds of music, everything from, you know, going and talking to, um, you know, some um, guy doing Gregorian chants to, you know, modern ballet to learning the Texas two-step and going to strictly hardly bluegrass and all kinds of things. Very, very eclectic kind of taste. He also got very active in an, um, a place in the city called um, the Red Poppy Art House. And he had lots of happy times there, um, knowing lots of different work, you know, seeing in lots of different performers and, and being quite involved with that. And it was something that I think he truly enjoyed. Um, but yeah, he did enjoy going to events up until he couldn't really get around much, including events like, like this one. Um, so I, I don't know, um, if, Jonathan, if you're still on the call, um, but here's a picture of him. Um, listening to you um, when Jonathan was at a book launch of a novel that he had written in early times. Um, so I thought that was kind of nice. 
um, it wasn't all about health, though. And as time went on, one of the things that started he started to care about was more about ageism. And I think it's something that a lot of us think about at this point in our careers. Um, and he started talking a lot about this. So this was at the um, I forget which design and diversity, um, D design plus diversity conference. He spoke about it there. He also spoke about it here at Beikai. The, the very last um, sort of public talk that he did was on the Beikai stage, um, where he also chided himself, by the way, for going, I'm um, going back to that talk he did with Don and John. He chided himself for having called it out with the old and in with the new because he recognized that that was a mistake and that, um, you know, there's a lot to be gained from the collective wisdom that we all have. Um, I think I've already talked to this point about social media, but he found it very important for all kinds of things. Um, when he was asked once about where, um, where can, a student asked him where he could find a mentor and he said social media, um, that there's so much out there. Um, and so there's just lots of, um, lots of um, rich resources that kept him going. And he loved to travel. Um, and when he couldn't travel, he loved to read about travel. So if I have a stack of books about France and Italy in my house from all of his armchair travel, if anybody would like to read them, please let me know. Um, but yeah, travel was very important to him. Um, this picture I took in the hotel where he passed away. Um, it's a hotel in San Francisco. And I took this, I, when I found out about it, um, so he checked into the hotel. He was there for, oh, I should say that he wasn't staying in my house anymore. And he spent about six months after he left my house. And um, for the last month, he lived in this hotel in the, in the city. Um, and when I went to talk to them about the, about the circumstances, the people there were so lovely. And they said that he was so lovely. And he had, um, and when I walked into the hotel, I knew immediately why he wanted to be there. It was just like such his vibe, so much his vibe. I mean, the dancers, the, you know, they even, they, fortunately, they didn't take me into his room. Um, but they took me into a room like his, and um, it was just it was just so him. And evidently, when he he checked into the hotel, and he was there for almost a month, but when he checked into the hotel, um, the first thing he did was he signed up for the movie pack, um, so that he could watch movies and that they would bring him popcorn and you know stuff, you know, because he loved movies so much. Um, yeah, and we've talked about his love of. France and Paris in particular. This is a picture I found. He, he did this whole, he was taking these pictures of selfies, right? And he, self reflection. You can kind of see him in the, in the picture there. Um, and he really, really loved, loved Paris. And he dearly, dearly, dearly wanted to have his ashes cremated. Uh, well, have his, his ashes work. No. He wanted to be cremated. He wanted his ashes to be um, sprinkled in the sand. Um, part of them were, as it turns out, um, as it, I happened to, when I received the ashes, I happened to have some very dear friends of mine come through town who were staying with me and they were going on to Paris and they took a little of Richard with them. And so this is a uh, pictures that they sent me from when they sprinkled his ashes just about, let's say about six weeks ago, eight weeks ago. Yeah. And the last, this brings me back to the chateau. And I firmly believe, I don't believe in reincarnation or any of that, but there's a little kid. Oh, no, he's not so little. You see that kid, that kid up there? You see him? That's, he's, that's, that's um, Nico. Nico's a 20-year-old who put a note on my door about two months ago. 
asking if he could buy that car. And I was still in Australia, but a friend of mine found the note and I texted Nico and I said, you don't want that. It, it was sitting in front of my house for three years. It hadn't been driven. It had four flat tires. I could not get the thing started. Um, he didn't, Richard didn't take care of it. The doors didn't lock. The seats are all ripped. It was, it was filled with water. Um, but Nico was insistent. And I said, I said, well, I'm not going to be back for a month. And he said, okay, well, thanks anyway. The day I got back, a week and a bit ago, I got a text message from Nico. Can I come over tomorrow and take a look at the car? He said. I said, sure. I said, but I don't want you. I'm not, I don't want you. You're, it's too expensive. It's not going to work. You're put, sure. He came over. He was the sweetest kid. He had his brother with him. They had a battery with them. They had spark plugs with them. They had an air pump, a manual air pump to pump up the tires. They couldn't get the car started. They came back the next day with a distributor cap. Uh -huh. That was the ticket. All it needed was a distributor cap. I sold the car to Nico for a dollar. I gave him the dollar so he could give it back to me because legally you need to pay and I didn't want him to I didn't want to take any money from him. That was a, that was last Saturday. He that was a week ago. Last yeah, that was a week ago. This past Saturday, he came over to show me what he had done to the car. He cleaned it up completely. He had it smogged and registered and you know and insurance he took out, ripped out all the carpeting. He dyed the carpeting black so it was nice and clean again. He put it all back, got new floor mats, painted everything. He hasn't painted the hood yet, but the chateau lives. And this kid, Nico, is such a sweet kid that I firmly, firmly believe that it's Richard. And so. With that, I just want to thank all of you for coming tonight. Um, this has been wonderful. Um, and, you know, with, so to Richard, with gratitude and love for all you've done for us all, rest in peace knowing that you've made your mark and you've left the world a better place. And Thank you so much.